This week on Arizona Illustrated, Art Alley Gallery. This pandemic had uh, been a real hard on all of us. And then I got the idea of creating an art gallery in the alley. Body of work, Nicole Miller. It's made of molds from Michael Jackson's actual body. Pole dancing in Tucson. They're doing something that's good for their body. It is for regular people. And Ellen and Lacey. Lacey's like that little poem. I have a little shadow that goes in and out with me, and what can be the use of it is more than I can see. Welcome to Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara, and we're here at the Tucson Botanical Gardens on a brisk fall day. It's beautiful. You know, these gardens are an oasis in the heart of Tucson, and outdoor spaces can be great for our mental health and our social connections. That was certainly the case during the pandemic when gatherings indoors were discouraged. Former teacher Josie Zapata grew closer to her neighbors during this time, and together they use their alleyway and their miles east-west neighborhood in Tucson to create a shared sense of community. The last five years of my teaching experience, I had the best job ever. <laughs> I taught a class called Outdoor Learning and basically uh, allowed me to use my philosophy that I believed in, which was letting children be able to play outside, to be learning from their environment, to respect public spaces, and to be stewards of keeping that space beautiful and that they want to be part of. The alley is a public space that we basically have taken ownership. I had lived in this neighborhood for 40 some years, and I have become real close to my neighbors. Rosanna and Luis are one of my closest friends. This pandemic had uh, been a real hard on all of us. Uh, I lost five family members, close friends. <laughs> and so I try to do positive things to keep myself going. And then I got the idea of creating an art gallery in the alley because the alley was used for dumping old furniture. Rosanna and Luis were the first one that said, yeah, let's do something with it. And so I was amazed at what they created. I lost our chess teacher, and I lost my um, grandpa as well. And just like my dad, still miss him. I lost him when I was eight years old, and it was hard getting through that loss and everything. Every single Saturday, we would have a music night, and he would put on different types of music. And that's why I started loving music, and then I started doing art. I just really like to just free draw and just lots of coloring and drawing. It expresses my um, my emotions a little bit because the loss of my dad and. I think it'd bring it out just a little bit more, but not that much. Well, Josie. <laughs> the 60s and the pandemic were very similar to me in emotions. I grew up in a generation that was very scary, the same feeling, because I was in high school when they first killed the, the first soldiers in Vietnam. And it turned out that I lost friends from high school and relatives. At the beginning of the pandemic, I felt the same 
feeling of not understanding what was happening. And as a pediatric nurse and as an educator, I have been real worried about the long impact of isolation for one year. And parents are worried about their jobs and they're also isolated with their work. And children didn't have the experience to play freely outside and, and express their, their feelings, their fears, and making happy experiences. My friend Autry, his parents, they were nervous about the pandemic and I don't blame them because it's pretty scary. And he had a lot of anxiety, so playing video games with him helped him and telling him like, hey, you can make art and then he just send it to me and I'll hang it up. We're slowly going back to normal, but I always want to encourage people to like love art and mostly everyone already does. So half of my work is already done. Since we've had the gallery, we haven't had any furniture dropped off. We haven't had trash. And uh, we've had a good response from people walking. And it's um, an opportunity to meet new people, an opportunity to share ideas and feelings. And so it's going to be an ongoing process. As long as I am healthy and, and have the energy, we'll keep doing it. After the construction's done, it'd be pretty cool, like having a whole entire art gallery alleyway, <laughs> just um, like walking through it and hanging up pictures, like or paintings, like saying helpful words to get through the pandemic, and for them to be calm and encouraging them, and that like me, it may be just a little bit hard, but you can get through it. I think the pandemic, we're healing in, uh, in different ways. I see a lot of compassion and love and wanting to help. Those skills are not lost in children, especially Luis. He's had difficult losses. And to me, he's my hero. Nicole Miller is a renowned artist and Guggenheim Fellowship recipient with Roots in Tucson. Her work includes video installations and sculpture that often depicts black bodies. In this piece, she reflects on her current project and we look back at her previous work that, as she describes, allows her to speak through another language that isn't words. Michael in Black is a bronze sculpture that I made here in Tucson. It's made of molds that I got a hold of that were made from Michael Jackson's actual body in the 1980s. And so I made this sculpture with Michael Jackson's body, which is a kind of body that was changing constantly in real time in front of us in the media. I think this idea of celebrity sort of turning a human into an image and how we can sort of consume people in that way or turn them or transform them into something that can be consumable is very much what that work and that show was about and specifically black bodies. I had made a work called Anthony Aquarius before that. That's a portrait of this man named Anthony Aquarius, who's dedicated his life to embodying Jimi Hendrix. And he had told me that he had sort of decided at the age of 14 to try to completely embody what it meant to be Jimi Hendrix. So he always speaks with a kind of voice that sounds like Jimi. And he learned to play the guitar with his teeth and with his left hand. And so this idea of like embodiment is very much a part of a lot of my work. I look and I see the shotgun and he's nervous, he's shaking. And now it occurs to me that I'm in 
trouble. I had read about this finding by a neurologist named Ramakandran, and he had found a way to help people with phantom limbs who had um, lost an arm and were suffering from phantom limb syndrome. And he found this very simple exercise where you would put a mirror where your missing arm, say, is. He, in a way, kind of proved looking at something could sort of physiologically change you, can amend your relationship to reality or to oneself. I made this work with this man I met named David who had a missing arm. And I approached him in the street and I asked him if he had this problem. And he immediately got really excited because it is something that had ruined his life, really. Um, I mean, people with phantom limbs often really suffer quite a bit. And I brought him to my studio and he told me the story of how he lost his arm while he did the exercise for the first time. I think, you know, I started getting into this idea of embodiment um, as related to this process, which led me to make this work about Anthony Aquarius and then into this work that is an actual sculpture instead of a moving image that is maybe the closest embodiment of Michael Jackson we can have at this point with him not being with us anymore. The whole universe, all planets, moons, stars, animals, everything in life, wants to expand. That's what roots are doing when they penetrate the earth and bloom. That's what gems are doing with their radiance. That's what humans are doing in their lives. You want expansion. So from when you began as an embryo to when you're about to leave the planet, you have transformed your life. You've gone on a journey and you can look back at the end of your life and say, well done. Because you don't want to be, as Yogananda says, a psychological antique. You want to have grown. You want to have expanded until your expansion gets into infinity. To the Stars is a film that I made that was commissioned by SF MoMA. It's a film and a laser light installation. It's a kind of mosaic that's a portrait of many people like Alonzo King from the Lions Ballet, who's just this incredible speaker that also can express amazingly through the language of dance. And I ended up finding this just brilliant, amazing woman, Dr. Yvonne Cagle, who is a NASA astronaut. Her area of study is what happens to the body in space. I know the only way to experience and learn from the full capacity of the human body and our resiliency both as humans and humanity, is for us to allow ourselves to evolve in a planet outside of our origin. So as we evolve, the question is, what will we look like? What will we feel like? How will we care for each other? How will we love each other? I think if you're next to the sculpture, it feels maybe that you are next to a kind of ghost or a dead body that doesn't exist anymore. And it's even more profound because he's not with us and also because his history is so you know, complicated and disturbing. Artists speak through another language that isn't words. The material of the bronze is like heavy and it's very dark and solid. It is a kind of language. Cinematography is a language that expresses so much emotionally, intellectually, without using words. The lasers that I make are pure light. Light is a means of communication. A lot of what I consider to be my craft is in those languages. The body of work is a kind of conversation. Social media apps like Instagram and TikTok have helped to popularize the art of pole dancing in recent years. And now Tucson has become an unexpected hotbed for this burgeoning fitness craze. You know, it started in strip clubs, but it's become mainstream. And now one local organization is even leading the charge for it to become an Olympic sport. It was kind of a dream of mine. And then the building became open and I decided that I was gonna do it.
Hi, my name is Brenna Murray. I'm the owner of Kinetic Arts Tucson Pole Dance and Acrobatic Training Studio and in the heart of downtown Tucson. So just go ahead and follow along with me. I've been pole dancing since 1998. I started at Curves Cabaret when I was very young. I was at a fitness training for a different fitness certification. The place where the class was held was next door to a pole studio. And I literally put my face on the glass and I was like, oh, that is where I'm supposed to be. There were all different body types, but these women were still just absolutely gorgeous in how they moved and they looked so empowered. Hi, I'm Katrina Wyckoff, and I am the owner of Tucson Pole Fitness and the president of the U.S. Pole Sports Federation. I had a local dance studio here. We put up poles at our dance studio. <laughs> we just had a massive influx of people who wanted to come and try pole dancing. If you want to, you can put your hand underneath. Pole was a reclamation of my sexuality, sensuality, femininity, but most importantly, power. Can I show you what I mean? It's a reclamation of power. Pole is one of the hardest sports literally that ever existed. It's so challenging. Not a single muscle in your body does not get worked. That mm. arm's so significantly less strong. The poles now spin. They spin these days. They didn't always spin. They've only started spinning within the last 10 years, which has really been a game changer for the industry. Like there, yeah, you got it. People want something to make them feel good. There's so much, there has been so much depression and just hard times that people have gone through. And when they come and they do poll, they're surrounded by people who are cheering for them. They're doing something that's good for their bodies. It is for regular people. We have grandmas, we have their children that come with them. I have definitely had grandpas who have come and tried the class before. We help people to feel sexy. And now that can mean so many different things. To us, feeling sexy is more about being very, very self-confident, being powerful, feeling beautiful in the skin that you're in. My daughter started taking dance classes at the dance studio that Katrina has, and it was part of our family package. My younger daughters did it too for a while, and then I'm the one that ended up being the <laughs> Lifer. <laughs> First goals are like climbing the pole, and then you see other people doing cool tricks, and you're like, oh, now I want to do that. And then you just keep like leveling up, and just there's no end to pole. It just seems like every time you reach some kind of goal, you're like, oh, well, there's the next thing. <laughs> So in 2015, we started competing with the U.S. Pole Sports Federation. I competed with a woman named Brianne McClanahan and we did a doubles routine. And so we were the national champions. We went to several world championships. We competed all over the world. We were the delegates for the world games. 2020 in February, I took over that organization. So now I'm working as the president of the U.S. Pole Sports Federation with the ultimate goal to bring pole to the Olympics. Late 2018 is when I discovered this place. And I discovered it because uh, they were doing a pop-up strip club here. And it was like inclusive, women, men, whatever gender. I started doing it and I just never stopped because I loved it so much because it's like, I need to do something physical, you know, in order to, you know, just for like my mental health, but I hate going to the gym and I, I don't like most sports, but this sport is so artistic that it, uh, it captures my interest. I started dancing when I was 17 years old. That was in 1998. And back then, 
pole dancing was not really a thing. There were some girls that knew like a move, but for the majority, people just use the pole as a prop to walk around to hold themselves from not falling down in stilettos. Pole dancing is an industry that was built by dancers. That's like the really important piece. It's the story starts in the strip club. We in and of ourselves are not teaching stripping here. We're teaching pole fitness, but we, we honor and appreciate and realize that this does come from the stripping industry. However, it, it's evolving, you know? Like it has evolved, it's beyond the clubs. And it's amazing that these people, like all different kinds of people can access it. I think it will continue to grow for many reasons. If you get out in front of people and you dance and you don't have very many clothes on, it's like, you know, there isn't much left to hide. And uh, it forces you into a situation where you have to be okay with that. And besides just body confidence, it's like it's been a way for me to explore like more femininity and uh, things that most of my life I felt like I didn't have a space where I could, uh, you know, explore that side of me. It's been proven that pets can provide therapeutic benefits for their owners. When Ellen Morell adopted Lacey back in 2010, the two quickly became constant companions. And Ellen decided to share that bond with others, providing comfort and friendship. So here's a look back at our story about the bulldog and the owner who found their calling. I'm Ellen Morell, and I'm a chaplain for Harmony Hospice. And this is Lacey, and she's my therapy dog and goes with me to visit my patients. Come on. And uh, we just visit people and enjoy ourselves. Good girl. Good girl. <laughs> Hi, Donna. This is Ellen from Harmony. I was just checking in to see how you're doing. You've been through a difficult period, and I hope that you will take a day or two to uh, relax and refresh and uh, rejuvenate yourself. I try to, to check on the diagnosis before I go to see people because sometimes it makes a difference. I have been a dental hygienist, which I did for 10 years. I have been a planned giving consultant, which was lots of fun. Helping rich people give money away is not a bad way to make a living. And then finally, I succumbed to the call from God and became an Episcopal priest. On my way, when I decided to move to Arizona, on my way here, I had another call that said, you need to be a hospice chaplain. So I came and applied and got a job, and here I am. Let's go, go see the veterans. Let's go, come on. You see the puppy, huh? See her? Lacey, can you sit? Now, can you wave to little boy? Wave. Good girl. <laughs> Were you in the Army? We thank you for your service. Because what you did made it possible for us to do what we do. So we really thank you. This is my husband, Bob Budak. He's a Vietnam vet. He worked, he was in the Army. This actually is a wonderful place. We worked really hard to get him here and we're very excited. And you notice how alert he got and how excited he was to see Lacey. So he's very receptive to um, therapy. He's receptive to having people come and talk with him and he enjoys it and he smiles. He smiles, yeah. <laughs> Lacey has been my friend, my sidekick for years and years. She's eight years old. I got her when she was just a puppy. My son had her mother, and I went to see the puppies, but told him I would not, under any circumstances, take a puppy home. And I don't know how it happened, but on the way home, I looked over and there she was. <laughs> and we have been pretty much inseparable ever since.
So if you go to our website, harmonyhospice.org, and you look at Meet the Employees, Lacey is very on the very top. <laughs> she has her own professional photo. And so she, like, we, all, we often joke, again, she's the boss. <laughs> I read his book, and I thought, I thought he was a good man. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I've had lots of dogs in my life. I've always had dogs. And I've loved them, and I've cared for them, but I've never had one that I actually called my sidekick because it's, Lacey's like that little poem. Remember when you were in grade school? I have a little shadow that goes in and out with me and what can be the use of it is more than I can see. <laughs> well, that's Lacey. Everywhere I go, she goes. If I happen to come in without her, the question always is, where's Lacey? Where's Lacey? Hi. Hi. I brought Lacey to see you. Lacey or Stacy? Lacy, like lace on your dress, like lace fabric. Oh, how can anything be so ugly and so wonderful? <laughs> I like to tell the story about when we, I first took her to see some people. There was a lady who had advanced dementia who could not say anything intelligible, who sort of just chattered all day. I walked in with Lacey, and she looked down at her and said, nice dog. <laughs> so Lacey touches people uh, in many ways that are surprising. More than once, when she's been invited, she's climbed up with, in bed with somebody and laid with them as they were dying, so that they die with their hand on the nice, soft, furry head. She failed agility, she failed obedience, uh, she, fa she really failed motherhood, because it took us two and a half years to get her pregnant, and then she ended up with three living puppies and hated them, <laughs> really hated them. Sit, wave, good girl. But she's finally found her calling. She's as good a therapy dog as you could have. Hey, you've made a friend. You know how to make dogs uh, happy. She's, she's, she's great. I consider this part of my service to God. I like, I like animals. And even though I'm not as religious as a lot of chaplains are, I don't insist that people pray. I don't insist that they find salvation in Jesus. I think this is my ministry to the world and Lacey's ministry to the world. So we're doing this really out, truly out of a sense of call, as a minister would say. Ellen Morell is now retired and Lacey unfortunately passed away a few years ago. Thank you for joining us here on Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara, we'll see you next week.